Grandpa Tell me about the good old days Sometimes it feels like This world's gone crazy Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voices of Their Time series. A look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. I'm Bob Bullen of Middle Tennessee State University, standing at the east entrance of historic and beautiful Rutherford County Courthouse. My guest today is Mr. Willie Brandon, who epitomizes the very best in the American work ethic. What is so unusual about Mr. Brandon? Well, consider this. Anywhere you go in the United States, it is unlikely that you will find a major public building taken care of by an 85-year-old custodian. This courthouse has witnessed war, slave auctions, political events, community entertainment, personal drama, and Willie Brandon, our guest today, has also experienced a great deal of history. Their background in some ways is similar. This building was completed just before the American Civil War, and Mr. Brandon's grandfather was a slave who was sold at an auction on the grounds of the courthouse. So, Mr. Brandon, you have uh, been at the courthouse for over 12 years now, and you're 85 years 85. of age. And you're an institution in this county, and you and the courthouse just seem to go together. But why do you keep working? I keep working because I feel good. And I continue to work as long as I feel good. Well, I think we should go inside in the courthouse and sit in the remodel lobby and sample the flavor of the courthouse and sit down and tell your story. So let's invite everybody to go in with us and enjoy the flavor of the courthouse. Well, Mr. Brandon, here we are in the restored lobby of the Rutherford County Courthouse. On the wall behind us, we'll see a mural, the Pride of Tennessee, donated to Rutherford County by Nissan Motor Company, and the artist was Michael Sloan. This mural depicts seven uh, or 11 historical figures in the state of Tennessee, so with that backdrop, we'll move right on in to our interview. Mr. Brandon, do you mind if I call you Willie? No, I don't. Okay. You were born and raised out in Reedville. I was born and raised in Reedville. What year were you born? I was born in 1906. Well, let's talk about the uh, conditions of the community and what it was like in, in Reedville back early in the century. Tell well, me about your family and your home. Well, I was a son of a... My father was named Charlie Brandon. My mother was named Jimmy Brandon. I had one sister, and uh, in the community at that time, we uh, lived in a small community, and uh, people would visit each other from week to week, especially on the weekend. But through the week, most everybody was doing something. Willie, describe your house. What kind of house did you live in? I lived in a two-room log house. And uh, it was uh, mortared with clay. The logs was put together, and it, the mortar between those logs was clay. Do you know who built that house? No, I don't know who built the house. And I was four years old when we moved in the house. And I stayed there until I was 17. How did your family uh, come in possession of that land, and how many acres did you have? 33. My father bought the land, he told me, from a man, and he made the down payment, and he bought the 33 acres for $500, what he was supposed to pay. And uh, he made his first down payment with a mule coat, and the coat was valued at $50. And from there, he had three years to pay the $500. And from there, he went from just place to place to get the $500 and pay for it in the three years. For those people watching this, we're deliberately in the lobby of the courthouse because Willie is a, a major part of the courthouse, being a custodian here for many years, and we would like to sample and pick up the flavor of the 
traffic going through here and how the courthouse works. So as we go through our interview, we will have people coming and going from time to time. Willie, your grandfather was a slave and you got to know him very well and yeah. he was a major influence on uh -huh. your life. I was 33 years old when my grandfather died. My grandfather was sold somewhere over here in this, around this courthouse. At the age, he said, of about 14 years old and was shipped to the Virginia and was freed in Virginia. So you think there was a slave auction somewhere around the courthouse well, and your he grandfather was sold? Was sold. Here, yeah, there was a slave auction here. And he was sold, he said he brought $750 and was shipped to Virginia and stayed in Virginia till he was freed. And after he was freed, he said the man that he was his uh, master told him, says, Jim, you're free and I'll have to pay you a salary if you work. And he stayed with his uh, slave master two years and worked and made enough money to come back to Tennessee. And said when he came back here around this courthouse was just a wilderness, just enough cut out here for the building. And said he helped to clear the land around this place. He said they'd cut it daytime, rick, and let it dry and burn ricks at night. He helped to clear this county up, my grandfather. Let's talk about your grandfather some more. As a little boy, you remember a, a, a big scar on his body, but he wouldn't talk about it. No, from the age, I was the first grandchild. And I'd uh, go and sit in his lap. And he had a scar that started right to the top of his neck. He ran down just as far as I could see down his shirt. And I'd asked him what caused that big ridge in his back. And when I do that, he'd slam me down and say, the one who did that will never do nothing to nobody else. So I don't know what happened. So it was a traumatic experience he must uh -huh. have had as, uh -huh. as, as a slave. He wouldn't talk about it. Did he ever tell you any stories at all about being a slave? Yeah, he told me when he was left here, when he left Tennessee, said they had a drove of slaves. And the small children, they'd pick them up and let them ride behind him on the horses. And he said when they got to the city, he was walking with a girl and said she was a mulatto. She wasn't a real dark person, she was a mulatto color. And said the girl told him that she'd never get to Virginia. And said when they got on a, said they had logs tied together or something that they floated across the Mississippi River on. Said when she got in the middle of the river, she jumped off and was drowned. She never did get there. And said you could trace them, says in the fall of the year, and those that were walking, the ground was frozen, and said you could trace them by blood running out the heels and feet and things, you know. Do you remember any other stories that he told you? No, that's about the biggest thing he told What did he do in his later years? Well, he came back here and went to farming, and he worked. I guess that's where I got some of it from. He worked till he was past 95 years old. So that's where you get the longevity. That's where I'm getting it that from. And he left here, he, he left here at 105 years old and rode to Chicago and I met him at the station by himself. Well, how did he act in a big city? He, he reacted fine. He was a friendly man. He liked to talk, and everybody loved him. They followed him just like he's following Santa Claus. He was black as uh, this chair, slick black. He had curls of white hair on that black face. He had white beard that hung to, to, in his chest and had blue eyes. Now, what was it? <laughs> but he was well known in the county, wasn't he? Yeah, he was well known. His name was Jim Brewer. Did he pass on any particular values to you that influenced your life, Willie? Yeah. He told me something that, is, that I've tried to follow. He said, always try to be honest with whatever you try to do. Well, I know you've lived your life that way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the situation you lived in as a child. Where did you get your drinking water? Spring. And there's no, I don't know, there's a spring in Rutherford County today. When I was a child, this county was full of streams of pure 
water rutted out from under the ground. Man has destroyed it now. We haven't got it. Where'd you get your clothes? My mother made them. She made my coat, pants, underwear, <laughs> knitted my socks on a knitting machine. Did you have a store in the area? Yeah, I had one store in the area. But the store, we'd buy coat. The, the, big, the largest things they buy in these stores is tobacco, snuff, different things like that. But we raised all our food. Did you have any other children to play with in the neighborhood? Yeah. There, there was two black families in the neighborhood, and the rest of them were white. And we all played together and had fun together. I'd visit them, they'd visit me. If I'd go to the white lady's house where my friend was and get in trouble, she'd whip both of us. And if, I would, and if he came to my house and we got in trouble, my mother would whip both of us and there wasn't nothing said. That's the way we got along. <laughs> well, Willie, you were raised in the days of segregation and lived a great deal of your life during that time. I lived all my life in segregation up until, look, you know, when it passed in 61. Yeah, and it was in the, uh, the Supreme Court case was in 54, but it was in the 60s before we saw any difference. That's so. what I'm talking about before they signed it. Right. It was in the 60s. Well, tell me. Well, you uh, see how much I went through. Let's talk a little bit more about your relationship of yours and your friends with, with the white people in the community at that time when you were a child. When I was a child, I played. I like to play ball. I still live ball. And uh, I was on a team, and I was the only black boy on the team. The rest of my team was white. And I know we went to Woodbury, I believe, to play a team. And you know, there's always something going to happen. So one of the two of the white boys of Woodbury wasn't so well pleased with me playing on the team. But what happened, my team was all white and they cleaned them up and we played on the team. <laughs> we played on the team. The boys stopped those two, two boys that wasn't willing for the black boy to play. They said, yeah, he's playing, he's my friend. That's the way we live. Will he tell me about the road that went by your house then? The narrow, rough road. Just gravel and stone. A rough road. A narrow road. Just wide enough for one wagon or buggy to pass the other. Wasn't a wide road, just a narrow road. So it was a horse and buggy era that you grew up in? Yeah, horse and buggy. And most of the time, the average Black didn't even have a horse and a buggy when I grew up. Just a few was able to have a horse and a buggy. Did your family have much cash money or did you have to trade and barter for everything? Had to trade and barter for everything. Could you give me a, an example of how that worked? Well, the way they do, my father would uh, raise wheat. Well, in the fall of the year, when he'd gather that wheat, he'd swap that, trade that wheat in for money, you know, like that. Or he'd make a lot of corn, he'd sell the corn and get money like that. That's the way we produced the money that way. There wasn't no factories or nothing to work in. Willie, your, your mother was also a major influence on you. She was a school teacher, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, my mother was a school teacher. And my, she taught only black children, right? Only black children, right. And every child went in the law building and there wasn't no separate grades from one to the eighth, I think as far as it went back in that day. Everybody sat in the same classroom. If he's in the premise, he's in the same classroom as the one that was in the eighth. Now you told me your auntie was a teacher. My also. auntie was a teacher. I began school with my auntie. I went to school to my auntie till I was six. Eight. My mother brought me in and checked my work over, and she decided that I wasn't getting what I should have, and she taken me away from her sister and put me at another school under a man. And he whipped me every day for, cause my auntie had spoiled me, you know, <laughs> I do as I please. And he, he whipped me every day for the first 30 days to straighten me out so he could start learning. <laughs> 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 well, do you believe in whipping children today? There's nothing wrong with it, to my idea. To my idea, I don't think there's nothing wrong about spanking a child in the right way 
Well, try to remember what went on in the classroom when you were a child. What did you study and, and what happened on a typical day in school? Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened and uh, I'll never forget in school. I got 13 or 14 years old. And uh, we had to go to the spring to get our water. The teacher sent me and another boy after the water. And a white man, I'll never forget his name, was named Mr. Shelton, had a sorghum patch along beside the road where we had to go to get the water. Me and this boy gets over. Back in those days, they'd strip the, the spot and stuff off, off of the stalk. They'd leave the head on the stalk. Later, they'd come back and cut the stalk and the head off and carry it and grind it to make the syrup for molasses. He had stripped it and had it standing with the head on it, but he hadn't cut it from the stalk. We decided that we were gonna get over there and get the sod. In place of getting over and cutting one stalk, we cut three or four stalks and left them laying on the ground. The man was behind looking. He reported to the school. And that man would wrap two hickory limbs together, small ones, platinum. And whipped me, and I jumped out the window, and he pulled me back in the house and whipped me. <laughs> and these little legs had all kind of stripes on them. And I'll never forget that broke me from taking things that didn't belong to me. <laughs> that, that made an impression on you in more ways than one, didn't it? It's still, <laughs> it's still on it, and I'm 85. Willie, it was hard to get medical attention in those days, and one time you were severely injured in an ax accident, I believe. Well, back in those days, the blacks, I don't know about the whites, but the blacks in the rural areas, it was hard to get in the hospital. We didn't know nothing about going to no hospital. Your mother was the doctor. Your mother would care for all your wounds and sickness. You catch a bad cold like kids catch today. Your mother would catch you and take a flannel rag and put some grease and some of this on you and heat it and wrap it around your chest, give you a dose of castor oil and put you to bed and the next morning you'd wake up fine. Going about your business. Didn't take your temperature, didn't have nothing to take your temperature with. She'd say, stick out your tongue. If your tongue was coated, you needed medicine. <laughs> That's the way I come along. <laughs> Willie, religion played an important part in your life as a child. Tell me about religion in the black community when you were growing well, up. I went to church every Sunday. I had to go. There wasn't no such thing as a child missing church on a Sunday back in my days. All people, white and black, children, went to service on a Sunday morning. Now, he may do something out for service, but he had to go in church on a Sunday morning. That was just the rules that day. Were, were black preachers a major influence in the community? Yeah, black preachers was a major influence in the community. Of course, back in those days, black preachers was uneducated. See, we come a long way. I know you have. I've seen them come a long way. Well, that's why we're on tape today. We're trying to capture We have that. came a long way, especially the blacks. Well, See, well, Willie, tell me about singing in the church and a baptism and... and well, i tell you what, after they'd have uh, revivals back in those days, and they'd go on a week at the time, and like if you was gonna profess religion, I still don't figure this out, they have a long seat up in the front by the pulpit, and they these preachers would tell you to come up and sit down and profess religion. And they'd get you up on that seat and they'd sing and holler over you <laughs> for hours and they'd say, you got it, get up and confess it. And they'd get up and say they was ready and they'd walk you to the river and baptize you. I would walk to the river and baptize. So, so I, you vividly remember that? Oh yeah. Anything else you want to mention uh, about church and- I'll and, uh, tell you, let me see. In 32, 33 or 34, 
I walk from here to you know where the post office is out on. Right. I will lead you that stream of water but before you get to the post office. Yeah. I walk from here out there and was baptized in the thirties. So you walk from church. You were you baptized twice? No, no just once. Just once. Uh -huh. Let's talk about uh, the first time you saw an automobile. Oh man. I was around twelve. I was on my way from school, me and my sister. I had to walk three miles every day to school, right across the hill, whether it was raining or whether it was not, and I'd be at school at eight o'clock. Now the buses come along and they're not ready and got to walk out the door. But I walked and walked with me and my sister walked those miles and be in school. So we was on our way back from school and I heard a noise. I said, Lizzie, what is that? That was her name. She said, bro, I don't know. <laughs> and the closer we walked, the louder it got. And we saw something coming down the road and we hid behind a large stone until it got by. And when it went by, we went to the house and told our mother that we had seen something other and we didn't know what it was. But what it was was our mailman. <laughs> that was his first car. He was bringing the mail. <laughs> Can you describe that car? A little one-seated thing made like a buggy, a little T-model Ford. The one seat is all it had, and the little lights hung out from the side of it. A little short motor, but I didn't know what it was. Willie, when was the first time you saw an airplane? The first time I saw an airplane was, I didn't see it because I was in a rural area. The first time I heard of an airplane was when the, I guess it must have been around 1913. Somewhere along there, when I first heard of, about airplane. Lindbergh. When Lindbergh flew across the ocean, I heard of that in a plane. Okay. But for years, they were saying that they'd never get one to stay in there. I'd hear that. They'll never get nothing to stay up in there. And finally, I heard Lindbergh has flew across the ocean and back. That was my first year about a play. Now, what year that was, I, don't, I can't remember, because back in those days, we didn't have papers, so we didn't, I just hear from other people. So, you had no news except what travelers left you or what you picked up from That's people all. coming from town. That's all. Well, let's talk about coming to Murfreesboro. What would be your earliest memories of Murfreesboro? Well, my first earliest memories of Murfreesboro, I guess, I, between seven and eight, I had an auntie that lived in Murfreesboro, and my mother would bring, bring us down every now and then, maybe once a year, to Murfreesboro. They used to have carnivals who'd come to Murfreesboro, and she'd find the date that the carnival was coming, and she'd bring us to, to the carnival, maybe in the fall of the year. And uh, the elephants and the the bears and lions, they'd parade around the square with them in cages and we'd stand out on the sidewalk and look. But we didn't have enough money to ever go into tent. We'd just see the parade. We'd see the parade. And the folks with the balloons and the things, we'd get to see all the parade and go home. But Tell me about the black community at that time. Well, the black community was, was fair. We, they did the best they could back in that day. Uh, Mink Slide, was that part of it? Yeah, Mink Slide. What do you remember about Mink Slide? What do I remember about Mink Slide? On the holidays of the of, 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 like we had a holiday coming up, and you was in the area, in, in the country. If it's possible you'd get to come to town, you'd come to town and walk from uh, Vine back up to West Main here. That block was Mink Slide. And uh, they had one restaurant there and a drugstore and a pool room, black. And they just ram around from the pool room to the restaurant and talk and laugh and go home. Did you ever go in and play around the pool? 
Yeah, I, when I got old enough, I'd go in there sometimes and play. Much, play. much gambling going on in there, Willie? No, I didn't see too much gambling because we had free grabbers out at that time. It controlled it all that gambling stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about crime, Willie, uh, did you ever see much crime when you were growing up? Did you lock up your house? Did you trust your neighbors? You leave the doors wide open. And if it rained, the neighbor would come and close the door to keep it from blowing in the house. And everything would be in the house when you got home. And if there's something outside that they know was going to destroy, they'd bring it in for you. That's the way we live. You have a good story about some neighbors helping you when your family became sick. Yeah, and, that was about and that right around World War I. Could that you tell me that? World War I, yeah. My father was a type of a person who would always try to do more than he could do. <laughs> he, he was that ambitious. Anything he started, he'd try to have more than he could really take care of. And it was in early April. He had in 50 acres of corn, five acres of corn, a cotton, and a lot of hay. And we had all, just got it all planted. And he came in at noontime and said he was sick. My mother felt his head and said, you got a hot head, you sick. He went to bed that afternoon to get up. Well, that left me and another boy that he'd taken to raise to work. I was 13 years old, so we went to work. The next afternoon, I came in sick. I went to bed. Three days later, the other one went to sleep. And we had what they called uh, influenza. I don't know what that was. That was in April. We stayed sick from April till September. The doctor in the rural community, the whole community was down with it and he'd go from, had one doctor. He's waiting on the whites and the black. And he would make his round with his saddle pack on the horse with the medicine with him. You didn't go to no drugstore, the doctor carried the medicine as he went. So he'd come in and give you a pill and tell my mother what to do. So we laid there and we got worse and worse. And I laid until I'm thin anyhow, till the skin off my hips. You could see the bone. My father laid, he was a heavy man. He laid down until he was 115, 120 pounds. And our next closest neighbor was a white man. His name was Martin Jemison, and he was a heavy man. He weighed 300 pounds. And he says, if I get that disease, it'll kill me. He says, but I'm going to do all I can to help. He'd bring water and set it on the porch for my mother to eat. He'd feed the animals, take care of those. And my father got why he was able to look out the window and he lay there and look and say, the weeds is going to destroy my crop. I know it won't make nothing. We laid there until the fall of the year, nearly time together before we could get up. And he had the best crop that he'd ever produced in his whole life. And the white people made it. So in many ways, uh, your neighbors saved your life that time. They saved him from losing his second place he bought because he was going to pay for it from the, what he made off of the place. And they saved him. Willie, World War I is characterized by a great flu epidemic that mm -hmm. went all over the world. Uh -huh. Now, what do you remember about this in the community other than what happened to your family? Well, I remember coming to town during that time, and Cassius was pie stacked up, just like you'd stack up wood at the station here waiting for people to people that went away and died, you know, to bring them back home to bury. Like if a family got stricken with that flu, in one week's time, he destroyed the family. They'd all be dead. That's where he killed them. So where'd you see these cas caskets uh, stacked up? They hit the station here. Down, the, down the railroad station. Railroad station. I was on stack. Let's mention one more thing about World War I. Your father was drafted, but he wasn't called up, but you had a cousin that served. I had a cousin that served, and I uh, picked him up after World War I. I came to town and get to get him, to bring him home after, after the war. 
and he's been dead about eight years. Well, let's mention his name because he was a combat veteran, uh -huh. wasn't he? His name was James Brandon. What do you remember about him coming home? It was quite a celebration, wasn't it? Oh, it was a celebration. The whole community celebrated, white and black. We had a big time. They had barbecue and fish, and they had a big dinner for him. And, and oh, we had a good time. And I enjoyed looking at him because I'd never seen no suits on nobody before. That big hat with the balls on it, and the wrap leggings, and the shiny shoes. And I'd follow around him and just look. <laughs> <laughs> so he was quite proud of his service, oh, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He was proud. Well, your family moved to Chicago, so tell me how that happened. Talk about your father a little bit and how uh -huh. that happened. My father, we left here in 1923. What happened? There were some people that lived here had moved to Chicago. Uh, they came back here for, to attend a meeting at, here in Murfreesboro. And my father left the country to come to the meeting here in Murfreesboro and uh, was talking to them. And they was telling them how much he could earn in Chicago. So he was an ambitious man. He, he couldn't read and write, but my father was an ambitious man. He comes home and told his mother, he says, I'm going back with them and look it over. She told him, okay. So he went back to Chicago with them and stayed a week. When he came home and back in the country, he couldn't even go with his hat in his hand. We moving. We go in Chicago. My mother says, wait a minute now, wait. Oh no, I done seen all I want to see. I can make, I can make uh, seven dollars a day in Chicago and making a dollar and a half here. That was exciting. Yeah, that was exciting. Making a dollar and a half a day here. And he's going to, he says, I can get on construction up at seven dollars a day. Yeah, we leave it. <laughs> we gonna sell the farm and all the livestock and go. My mother says, Charles, you got a handicap. See, she was a school teacher. And she, he couldn't read and write. And I always wondered, I'd asked her, why did she marry somebody that couldn't even read? She told, she'd tell me I loved him. I said, you must do. <laughs> That's what I'd say. <laughs> so uh, she decided, she says, Charles, you have a handicap and it's, I wouldn't advise you to go to Chicago because you can't read. You can't write. And saying it's going to be a handicap. Oh, I'm going. I care what you say. She says, well, if nothing else will do you to go, I'm willing to sell the livestock off the place, but not the farm. I'm going to sell the farm. She says, I won't sign it. And you can't sell it. So she didn't sign it. And he couldn't sell it. But you went to Chicago. He sold the livestock off of it. How did you get to Chicago, Willie? On train. On the train. You remember that ride up there? Yeah, the first time I'd ever been on a train, you know it or something. I was scared to death. Was Chicago frightening to you when you got there? Sure. Out the woods and went to a large, the second largest city in the world, you know it was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me the sights of Chicago in the early 1920s. Well, in the 1920s, they were using horses and wagons in Chicago. There's the living milk with horses in Chicago in the 20s. And I'll tell you something else in the 20s. It wouldn't surprise you no morning to wake up, it'd be 25 below zero. See, the climate has changed there now. It's clean all over the country. I got a daughter living, was born there. And the climate is just about like it is here now. But in the early 20s, it got cold in Chicago. Lake Michigan would freeze over while they could drive a loaded truck across. And I've worked out at 22 below zero in Chicago. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but I want to capture the atmosphere of, of Chicago when you arrived there. Did you know anybody when you got there? I know those people that came here and got him. That's the only people I knew. Now, you had a nice apartment for your family in Chicago, didn't you? They prepared, they had rented, you know, those folks that lived there had looked out for an apartment for him. And so we had a nice apartment, yeah. As you said, your father couldn't read, but he could really get around Chicago, couldn't he? Better than I could. Before we left, we stayed that 
15 years. And when he left there, I'd asked him where certain places was. And how he learned to travel the city, I don't know. But he'd go anyway. What type of work did your mother do in Chicago? Day work. She'd go, she worked for Jewish people, rich people, out on the north side of Chicago. And she'd go from one place, one house to another, each day of the week. You were used to people being friendly and very open in the South, but in that's Chicago what, it changed a little bit. That's what scared me when I first got there. I'd say, good morning, how are you? And they'd jump off off the street and look at me. <laughs> and uh, they thought I was crazy. See, nobody don't say nothing to nobody in these large cities. And I'd say, how are you, sir? He'd look and run, cause he thought it was crazy. Well, Willie, you had to go to work just like your mom and dad, and your first job was with the railroad, I believe. Yeah, I worked in New York, Pennsylvania Railroad, the first job I had. It was on the outside. And he had a little stand, a little connection stand like that man's got there on now, but it was in, closed in. And every time I'd come by with that wheel bar, that woman would have a hot cup of coffee sitting in the window, and I'd drink it. So one day, I got so cold, I felt like I was burning. And I went inside. I had on two pair of gloves. And she told me to pull my gloves off. I pulled the first pair off. The second I started to pull off, and I take my hand like this to pull them off. And this, I brought the skin. It was left in the gloves from the end of my finger to the throat. <laughs> so that taught you you didn't want to work outside anymore. I went preparing myself to get inside. <laughs> now, Willie, you weren't used to seeing very many black people holding positions of responsibility, but you saw that in Chicago, the, didn't you? When I got there, the first thing I met was a black instructor. Well, no, I wasn't used to that. You had a black foreman on Black the foreman on, in the New York Pennsylvania Railroad. The first man I worked on in Chicago was black. Well, did that give you some encouragement that you could be more than you ever thought you uh -huh. could be? Tell me about uh, how black people treated each other in Chicago. Well, they are not too friendly. In, in furthermore, nobody's got time to gossip. Everybody's on his way. But if you're in trouble, that'd help you. If you was in trouble, you could get help. But there's not a lot of gossip. Let, before we talk about your jobs in Chicago, let's talk about recreation. Did, did you go to the public parks? Did you go mm, to Lake Michigan? Did yeah, you go to the after movies? I learned, I'd go to Riverview Park. I'd go to all the parks. I, on a Sunday afternoon, I'd go boat ride. I learned after I stayed there a while, I'd go out on the boat, boat ride. I had a good time. Did you go to the movie houses? Yeah. Very so. I did, never did care too much about movie houses. Movie. But I don't know why. Chicago was the first time you probably saw a movie, wasn't that was it? That's the first time. What about the streetcars? You'd never seen a streetcar? I'd never car. seen a streetcar like I hit Chicago, and I was afraid to get on one. Did you go see the Chicago Cubs or the Chicago White Sox? I went to see the Cubs, yeah. But uh, I imagine I'd been in Chicago uh, six months. And I. After I learned to ride the streetcar, I'd try to find a seat where blacks were sitting. So one morning I got on the car and there wasn't nobody on the car, the street except me. And finally a white lady came in and sat down. And I was sitting next to the window. When she sat down, I went to urging to the window just as far <laughs> as I could go. And the lady looked at me and says, she says, well, what's your problem? I said, nothing. I didn't want to touch that lady, see? I was trying my best to get over <laughs> as far as I could get. And finally she told me, she says, you know what? Bless your heart, I feel sorry for you. Say, you from the South. She figured she said, you out right off, didn't she? She says, I'm not going to harm you. So it took you a while to get over traditions that you were accustomed to in the South, didn't it? Why, well, certainly. I was raised on the customs. 
to 17 years old, you can't change that fast. You got to play baseball some in Chicago, yeah. didn't you? I played baseball after I was married in Chicago. Was the, team, was the team integrated? Yeah, it was integrated. Well, let, let's talk about the uh, second job you took in Chicago. That was with the Jewish Laundry, I believe. Yeah, that was my second job. I stayed on it, too. I went in one morning and asked for... I, I had married then. I married at 19. And I was out of a job, and I went in a foundry one morning. Asked for a job. Well, I was smaller then than I am now. I weighed about 131 pounds. A man looked at me and see, I haven't got no lot of beard up here now. I'm 85. My face is clean up here at 85. So you know when I was a boy, I was spoon-faced. The man looked at me and says, a, a job? I said, yeah. He said, you're a kid. I said, I'm married and got two children. And he laughed. He says, I'll tell you what, if you can show me a marriage certificate and a wife and a child, I'll give you a job. But say, you can't stay in here. He said, you're too, too light. He says, every man I got in here weigh 185 to 190 pounds. And say, they'll kill you the first day I put you in this family. I said, I'm willing to try. He says, well, if you can show me a marriage certificate or either a wife, I'll give you a job. Well, I didn't live but two blocks from the manufacturer. I went home, got to it was, it was zero then. I wrapped the baby up, wrapped her up, and went in the front office with all of them. I said, here it is. <laughs> Willie, you stayed two years at the foundry, and then you went to work at a laundry. At a laundry. What kind of assignment did you have at the laundry, and well, how did that work out? Well, when I first went in the laundry, I didn't have no experience of no laundry work, so they gave me a job of keeping the floor clean. It was a large laundry, the second largest laundry in Chicago. So I'd push up the trash off the floor and do different little shows like that, and wash windows and first one thing and another. I did that for a year and a half, maybe, two years. So my foreman was an Irishman. He came by one day and he says, you look pretty intelligent. He says, I think you can do better than that. So he took taking hold of them and start training me of the works of the laundry. He started training me. He, he, he turned me different colors of, of, of uh, clothing, the type of but, uh, soaps and different things that you had to put in those colors to keep them from fading. I learned all of that. So I learned the whole faculty of it. After that, he put me over. Ten. So you were responsible for supervising ten people? I was responsible for ten people. When I left the job, I was responsible for ten people. And I had a good career. So How much were they paying you? $22 a half a week. That was good money then, good wasn't money. it? Good money. Tell me the shoveling snow story. Well, there were three brothers, three Jewish brothers that owned the building. Each one of them had a Cadillac car piece and they'd never come to, to the place together. Each one would come separately in those cars. So it started snowing on a Wednesday, I'll never forget. We had snowstorms up there then. It snowed a couple of days, day and night. Big place like that. So it was a snowstorm. The manager of the trucks told of all the truck drivers to keep the trucks in the garage. They had a garage, I guess, a mile and a half long. Had 150 trucks in the garage, steam heated. He told them to leave them in. This man, the oldest brother, come out and he had a fine voice. He says, hey, what's wrong with these trucks? <laughs> Get them out. They pushed the button. Every time he'd drive one out, he'd slam into that snow and stick. They say he's stuck. Stick them all up. They drove every truck out there and stuck them up. He got in his car, but he had chains on, front chains, but I don't hide that left. So before he left, there was 10 of us inside the building standing against the wall. Because we couldn't work because we couldn't get no clothes. As he went by, he says, hey, you, 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 you. 
hit some snow shovels and get out there and get a snowing. Shovel around these walls. It was a half a mile around the building. And I had a friend that, that I thought a lot of. And he carried candy bars in his coat pocket. That's what he'd eat for breakfast. He just kept candy bars in his pocket all the time. <laughs> his name was Bob. I said, Bob, are we going out there? He said, what about you going? I said, yeah. He said, get warm, get cold, and come in and get warm. Get out, got that show. The rest of them said, what's the use of going out and it's snowing? They didn't go. Six of us went. We'd shovel a while and come back in the house, shovel, and made eight hours doing that. The trucks were stuck in the front. About two weeks it cleared up. Everything was moving nice. He came in there one morning and said, you gonna have a meeting. He said, wonder what's wrong now? They done forgot about the snow. I had myself. He called a meeting and he fired everyone that refused to go to sh shovel the snow. He says, I just want to see you're supposed to do what I say to you. So, so you I learned early to obey the boss, didn't you? If you want to hold a job, obey who you're working for. <laughs> That's a good story, Willie. I want to remind you of three things that happened to you in Chicago. You, you had a radio for the first time. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about your first radio? Well, I didn't know exactly what to do with it because <laughs> I've never seen one before. But I finally learned how to tune it in and I said, look at it, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. You really? remember any programs you listened to? No. It's, okay, what about your uh, first telephone? Remember the first time you used a telephone? Uh-huh. I had the, had the wrong end of it up. The woman <laughs> told me, said, you don't have to turn it around. So I learned how to talk on a telephone. You had a car. You were able to own a car while, while Yeah, I owned a car there, and it come a snow blizzard, and my mother was going to work, and she told me, she says, uh, don't try to drive your car, because it was... Eight or ten below zero. After she left, I'm going to work in my car. So I got a block and slammed into a doctor and tore his car up. He had insurance. I didn't have nothing. But he was a nice fella. He says, now, he was on your way to work. I said, yes, sir. I got, then I had to call my mother. He said, I forget exactly how much money he wanted, but I didn't have none. So I called my mother and had to get the money to straighten that out. And that learned me about old bed. Willie, who taught you to drive? Myself. You did, huh? Where did you learn? I learned in the country before oh. I lived here. Oh, okay. Could, you could drive before you went to yeah, Chicago. Yeah, I could drive a T-model before I lived here. Now, you used to travel home occasionally on the train, come back to Murfreesboro and visit. Tell me yeah. about those train rides home. Well, the first one was hectic because I wasn't used to it, uh, riding with the white. You get down here in the Mason Dixie line, you had to change over. And, but I, I, I worked myself into it. I got what I could do. So once you crossed what's known as the Mason-Dixon line, you went back to the old segregation rules yeah. of the South. Yeah, well, I was used to that. It didn't bother me. I was raised on the segregation. Willie, let me ask you about uh, how much did it cost you to ride the train then? $17.84 a round trip ticket from here to Chicago. But <laughs> take you all day on the train? Yeah, all day. You pay 17 I don't know what the fares from here to Chicago now but it was $17.84 a round trip. The Depression hit in 1929 and 1930 and you came back to Murfreesboro in the early 30s. Why did you leave Chicago? Well, my parents, they got old and wanted to come home. The noise of the city with the bug in them, you know. Yeah. And they wanted to come back home where it was quiet. So, I said, I was coming back. My sister told me, says, brother, you know that you can't make nothing at home, a dollar and dollar and quarter a day. Why give up your job to go back home? But I gave it up and come back home with my parents. You bought a home when you came back? I had you? bought the home while I was in Chicago. 
and paid for it. How much did you pay for that house? Five hundred and fifty dollars. Where was this house located? On up Old Council Street. Lived in it after I moved here fifty years. You still had the family farm though, didn't you? Yep. Willie, let me ask you about the effect of the depression on you. Did you lose any money in a bank? $84, the West Town <laughs> State Bank. <laughs> and they say that banks can't close, but I've lived to see them close up on my $84. Banks are closing up now. Do you keep your money in a bank? Yeah, but I'm scared. I don't know what to do with it. I ain't got much to keep no way. But what do I got in the bank? Some things don't change, do they? No. Willie, what kind of values did you pick up by this time? You were in your, let's see, 1934. You were 28, 29 years old. That's right. What type of values had you picked up to guide your life at this point? The biggest value I would have guide my life at this point is to be honest to everybody. Tell the truth. The truth will stand. You can tell it over. But you can't tell a lie over twice. But you can tell the truth over. <laughs> when you came back to Murfreesboro, you saw a lot of poverty here and uh, times were tough. How did you get through the depression? Well, I never did stop working. If I couldn't make a dollar, I'd accept a quarter. A quarter in your pocket beats nothing in your pocket. That's the way I always feel. And a lot of them refuse to do it. That's why they suffer. So you made it all right through the depression? I wasn't all right, but I made it. A lot of them didn't make it up, and I didn't have to go and beg. I don't like to beg as long as I'm well. I can make a living. It may not be a, a good a living as the next man, but you can live <laughs> if you try. Willie, do you remember where you were when World War II started? Yeah. I was over here on, uh, when World War II was over, I was standing in front of John Kilko's uh, funeral home. Yeah. But you don't remember the start of no, the war? No, I don't remember the start. Well, what did you do during World War II? You were too old to be in active military service. I lacked one year of being too old. And I got deferred that year. I was working right there where, where that one hour cleaner is. Where the one hour cleaner is now. I was doing, working there through World War II. What, what was located there? A restaurant. The old city cafe? The old city cafe was, was standing there. Now before we talk about that, didn't you work up at the military base in Smyrna? Yeah. Now you'd learned to cook by, by then. Oh yeah. So let's talk about how you learned to cook and talk about the military base and then come to the city cafe. Okay. I had a hard way learning how to cook. Because back in those days, they had four large motels here in Murfreesboro. Oh, hotel. And in those days, blacks, men, they called them chefs, was cooks. And they made a top salary for here. 15 bucks a week it was big money when you was making six. So I decided I want to learn how to cook. So I started in as a dishwasher. $3 and a half a week and my meals, seven days a week. I did that for a year, and one of the chef cooks had high blood pressure, and every now and then he'd have dizzy spells, and called me all out the dish trough to fix something, and he'd show me, you know. So I thought, well, I could do pretty good at that, and finally he got sick one morning where he couldn't show up, and he didn't have no choice but to call me. He says, Willie, do you think you can prepare breakfast for this? I said, yeah. I went through it like a whiz. Okay, the man finally got disabled to work. They had to have a cook. So they appointed me in his place. But here was the catch. I started there as a dishwasher three dollars a half a week. Now where was this? Down at the James K. Polk Hotel. Okay. Right where that bank is right down there now. All right. So I worked a couple of weeks and I had nerve enough to ask for a small raise. <laughs> He says, now, Ray, see, you remember you're a dishwasher. I said, yeah, but I'm doing a cook's job. I kept cool, didn't quit, but I went to look it. 
So I had a first cousin who came by the house one day and told me, says that they need a cook bad at the city cafe, a night cook. Say, Ricky, could you hold it? I said, yeah. He said, go talk to the man. So I went and talked to the man and got the job, so I left. <laughs> because I know I never could get up because I started from oh, there. I went to the city cafe for twelve fifty a week. She has a long ways from self. And I worked there a year for twelve fifty and I went from there to seventeen fifty. And I went from seventeen fifty to nineteen dollars and the Smyrna Air Base opened. The man had a niece I'm gonna show you when you got a friend. He had a niece that had a job in Smyrna. She came to the back door one day and says, Willie, you deserve to make some money. Say, you've been here 10 years with Uncle Dawson. And says, he's able to raise you a little more, but says he won't. Says, I can get you a job at the base. I said, get it. She got the job from at the base and I told them that I was leaving. I left the base and I had to go to be there in the morning at 5 o'clock. I was there at 5 o'clock and I'd get back here and sit out there in that coat yard at 1. And I was making $100 a week. And the first pay I got, I was with another guy. And he told me, he said, put your money up. He, I went out there and he was up under the car. He says, boy, somebody gonna rob us before we get back to Motorsport. And that was the biggest money that I'd about made since I'd been in the South, $100 a week. I stayed down there a couple of years at $100 a week. Maneuvers started through here. Soldiers in Motorsport were standing just like flies. This man was still over here. He had the food, he had everything, but he couldn't get it out of the kitchen. <laughs> I came down to walk one day, they did this away. He says, come here. He says, how you doing? Well, I said, I'm doing fine. He says, I need you. I said, Mr. Counselor, I'm making pretty good money. What are you making? I told him. He said, you got your car fed or gas to buy out of that? I said, yeah. He says, if you come back to me, I got it. I've been making $17 and a half a week now. I came back for him and worked for him through the maneuvers until he died at $100 a week. <laughs> Willie, we're just about at the end of part one of our mm -hmm. interview. Could you quickly tell me uh, what happened and what was the feeling in the community when President Roosevelt died uh, right before the end of World War II? Everybody was sad. He was a lovable person. He did a lot of good work for this country. He's the cause of me drawing these two dollars I'm drawing now. He started Social Security, you know. He started it. He withheld those pennies from me where I could get a dime or two at this age. He was a great man in my book. He was the first president you could identify with. Uh-huh. That's about the first one that I could follow. Well, this concludes part one of our interview with Willie Brandon an institution at the Rutherford County Courthouse, a major part of our community, and the custodian at the Rutherford County Courthouse. In a few minutes, we'll begin with part two. Grandpa, tell me about the good old days. Sometimes it feels like this world's gone crazy. Didn't seem so hazy 